Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Carlton People. We are really starting to ramp these up now with season 2021 amongst us. I've got Jake with me here and uh, maybe I'll let him tell you all about himself. Jake, what's happening, man? Hey, mate, good to be on. Um, yeah, a bit about me. So I, I've yeah, obviously been a Carlton fan my whole life. Um, my old man was the first member of his family that was born in Australia. So we kind of got the baggers by default, thank God. Um, mum's Richmond, so it could have gone either way, and I still reckon I won that deal. Um, and yeah, I'm a sports writer for Zero Digital Media as well, so I feel I've got a pretty good investment in the game of footy. Um, and yeah, the baggers have been the number one priority for the past 27 years of my life. Fantastic, mate. We're gonna we're gonna unpack a lot of that because there's a lot to get through. I, I love talking to guys like yourself who who work in what I call new media. Yeah. Um, the the new space, the emerging space. Uh, I think. Um, the mainstream or foot, let's just say mainstream sports media for now. Um, I think there's a bit of a shift in the industry. And so I think we'll touch on that a bit and, and how that's going for you. But um, we should obviously, obviously start with, with the blue baggers. You, you mentioned you were, you were born into the family. So you were, you were, you were handed the club yeah. luckily and you're 27. Is that right? Yeah. 27 this year, 27 this year. So you and I aren't that far apart. I'm 29. We've lived through a very similar experience, which is yeah. <laughs> we haven't seen much. No, no. What's it? Um, what's your first memory? Oh, of going to the footy, or just the or just baggers? just the baggers? Like, what's what's something that like? How far back does it go for you? So it goes a long, long way because me and my old man have we go every week and we have since I reckon I was born. But the first one I remember is um, I was a big sticks fan. Uh, not really sure why, but that was like I was big on sticks back in the day. And I saw my mum took me to Westfield somewhere and he had a book and I saw him and I was like, Mum, we're getting this book. Like, this, we're getting this book and this is how it's going. And he was like, No, I'm not buying you the book. Lo and behold, as a kid, I had a tantrum, full kicked off. <laughs> um, and then he took me to get a photo with him and we still got the photo somewhere of sticks holding me. I'm in tears. Um, and, and that was it. We left and I think mum thought she'd done the right thing, but like still to this day, I don't have the book. Um, but that's, that's my first, man. I remember being absolutely livid that I wasn't allowed to get this book. I was, I don't think I could read at the time. Yeah. But I was livid that I couldn't get my hands on this book. That's fascinating. Which Westfield? Where was it? Oh, I want to, oh, I reckon it would, I honestly couldn't tell you. I reckon it would have been maybe Eastland or something at the time, but okay. Wouldn't wouldn't have a clue really. Yeah. So you don't get the book, but you get the photo with sticks. I mean, yeah, it's not look, a bad trade off. No, like in hindsight, the photo is better than the book for a three year old. But like, I wanted the book, <laughs> and I didn't get the book, so I just didn't say sense. I was filthy. Yeah. I like I like how you said sticks, um, because it, like you said, you're 27. Um, sticks would have been hard to remember as a player mm. given your age. Um, but the fact that you did is, is interesting. Most people, I mean, for me, it was, you know, Kuda. I think also because he was, you know, he grew up in the area that I did as well. So there was a yeah. bit of a, an affiliation there and the Greek guy and, and whatnot. Um, but um, we're we're still looking out for that next full forward, uh, center half forward captain, yeah. aren't we? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think it's it's a position that we probably haven't filled since Fevlev, really. Um, and I think, you know, we've had a few great white hopes. I think the, the, the guys down there, now, your Harrys, your Gars, your Chars, I think they're, more than capable of filling it, but I think Sticks was a different presence, wasn't he? he just yeah. commanded everything around him, and I don't think he probably a one in one in a generation kind of player. I would say. Yeah. What about um, some of the early memories of going to games? Are there particular moments that, that stick out for you? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of memorable ones and a lot of forgettable ones, but any any of that stick in the mind as a, as a kid growing up? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, as I said, I went every week, so like heaps went on. Like you could pick a thousand things, but a few key ones I remember. Um, I remember the '99 prelim final. My my old man, for some reason, was dead set we were going to win that game all day, and we're sitting behind Freeman or player. I think at the time we just retired. Um, I think it was a his name's Adrian Fletcher. It's definitely Fletcher. I can't remember the first name, but yep, my old man had said all day like we'll win this, we'll win this. And um, half, when Essendon kicked that seven in a row, they got their lead in the third quarter. He uh, Fletcher turned around to my old man and just pretty much told him to shut up. He said, you got no idea. And my old man doubled down. He said, no, nah, no, nah, we're, we're fine here. Obviously, Kuda goes on to carry us home. And I just remember, like, we, we must have been surrounded by Essendon fans, but I remember just being, like, feeling in, in a hostile territory, but I loved it. Like, it was like, how good's this? 
Um, and then we went to the grand final the next week. Um, but I remember, I didn't really care. And like, we lost. And I remember I got interviewed on Channel 7 that, that day after the game. And I just remember not caring. Like, we beat Essendon the week before. That was it for me. Um, so that was that was a good one. And then I... Oh, uh, Ben Ben Dixon kicking the goal after the siren in 01. Oh. That I remember because it was the first, like, it was the first time I, like, I genuinely, because we were good back then in 01. And it was the first time, like, I was crushed by a defeat. Like, it just, it broke me because I'd never seen a goal after the siren. I didn't know you could do that. And that, that broke my heart. And then the year later, um, Peter Riccardi does it to us again. And um, in that that footage, when he's walking in to kick the goal, a, a flag gets in the camera, and that's my flag. Um, but I, I remember those like those two moments. They I reckon they were probably the sign of the heartbreak that was to come over the next twenty years. It really prepared you, didn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You mentioned um, you mentioned the '99 prelim, and I'm glad you did because I, I feel the same. I, I mean, the fact that in 2021 it gets played six times a year on Fox Footy. Something. Probably goes to show how important a win it was. I, I don't think non Carlton people, I don't think some Carlton people, probably a couple of years younger than us, I don't think they realize what that win was. Like that side, like that Carlton side wasn't that good. We then we got beat by Brisbane in the first final, oh, like the week before the finals, like 80 points. We we really weren't that good. Parker was under a bit of the under pressure. Cuda wasn't playing in the midfield. And that Essendon side had, had a monopoly on the grand final. Like they were the best side in the comp, and there was no question about it. Um, and it was the night before, I think, North Thump, Brisbane, and everyone was talking about how awful the prelims were and how the league wasn't deep or anything. Like that, to win that, it was just, I, think it was the, I don't think the club's had a better win in its history. And it also, it stopped Essendon than realistically winning 17 flags. Like they win that, they beat North, they then beat Melbourne the next year. They end up with 17. Mm. So everyone like... Oh, we won a prelim, but that is, that is as big as winning a flag when you're really trying to vie for that title as the most successful club in the country. Yeah. And at the time, we were ahead of them. I think, yeah, I don't think everyone recognises how big that moment that moment was. Yeah, hundred percent. As we enter that 2000 period and Stixie's gone, who was the the next hero for you? Who was the one that you really latched on to? Oh, uh, so it's pretty pretty easy for me, probably because I look like him. But Lance Whitnell. Was <laughs> I yeah, I loved Lance and it probably helped. Like I'd go to the footy and people was like, it's Lance, it's Lance. So it made it easy to like him. But um I also just loved the way he played the game. Like he read the ball. He wasn't quick, he wasn't fit, but he just read the play. And I love smart footballers. Mm. So I love that facet of his game. I just love the fact that he seemed to get it done despite coming back every summer with blonde hair and five extra kegs. It didn't matter. Um, yeah, so I was a big Lance fan. Um, I wasn't on the Fev train till probably 03 when he broke out. I didn't really, I didn't rate him that highly early and I'm happy to say that. Um, and another, another probably obscure one, cause I've always kind of made sure my favorite players aren't your, your best players. I was a big Darren Hume fan. Okay. Pup. Yeah. I, I just, he was, he was hard as nails and I was always laughing when he played like, He'd try and take on the biggest bloke, or he'd always try and tackle the biggest bloke. And I thought that is the greatest asset. Like this bloke just wants it. Like he yeah. genuinely wants it, and I lo- I love that. But yeah, then if we got to what O two, and that's when it all kind of went to hell. And then I think that's probably when you look at that list now, oh that playing group now. Like I've watched a few games from a channel on YouTube from that time, and yeah, trying to find a player there that you go, oh, how good's that? Because you got your rats and your Andy McKay's, your Brattles that are all coming to the end, and there wasn't really those players that were coming through. But um, one that I, for some reason, always had a weird affinity with Simon Fletcher. Mm-hmm. Just don't know really why. Just always like the cut of his jib. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking. That's actually the kind of answer I'm looking for. The the, the obscure, the the, the non mainstream answers yeah. because they're, those are the memories that will spark someone else watching this. Yeah, I remember I wrote a letter to the footy club. <laughs> I would have been about ten. We got beat by West Coast by hundred of points, and Fletcher didn't play. And I wrote a letter to Pay and just asking him why. Didn't get. Didn't hear back, which yeah. I thought was pretty rude, Dennis. But I was like, mate, you got to play Simon Fletcher. Like, why are you not? He's clearly on the bit. Yeah. So I was, so I don't know why. I still don't really have a reason. I just, I just liked it. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Well, you touched on YouTube. You touched on sending a letter. We're in 2021 now. It's a DM or an email. 
or a LinkedIn message um, where web, I feel like, like, our generation, we're obviously not blessed with the team that we follow in terms of the success that we've seen, mm. but we're very blessed in the accessibility to the game. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're in it. We, we are living through an era where you can watch a game overseas. You can watch a game anywhere where there's an internet connection. That's not something that was available 15, 20, you know, 25 years ago mm. and so on. Um, and also, obviously, as you mentioned, you um, you're in this new age sports media space. Um, touch on that. Give the viewers a bit of an insight as to how that began and, and where that stemmed from. Yeah, so it stemmed from pretty much the same as every kid. I was going to play AFL and I was going to play at Carlton and we were going to be really, really good. And then at about 12 or 13, I, dad just said to me, he's like, what are, you, what are you doing with your life? And I was like, what do you, like, I just got to high school. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, well, you're not going to play footy. Like, let's be realistic. What do you, what's your plan? Like, and that was that hit me square between the eyes. Like, what, do you, what do you mean? I'm not going to play AFL footy. Like, yeah. So then we had a chat and he said, like, what do you like doing? And I was, I hated school. Like, I was a notorious non attender for my yep. first four, three years of high school. Um, but the one thing I'd always go to was English. I really enjoyed writing and I was really good at it for some reason. Writing and talking was just something I, I did really naturally. Um, and I'd always play little games out in the backyard and for, I'd always commentate and it was just something like, like all my family knew if our Jake's outside, just let him go because he was commentating and doing crowd noise and all this, all the like. So eventually I was like, all right, well, this is like, this is what the only way I'm going to be able to stay involved in footy. Um, and it's something that, yes, yeah, commanded my life. So how do I, how do I monetize that essentially when I got older and it was writing. So I, I went to uni, did all the basic stuff. And then, and then I fell out of love with it a bit um, after uni and I went traveling instead and, really kind of put career on the back burner. I decided that um, I just wanted to be happy in life rather than work my ass off like a lot of other guys from uni. Like a lot of people from my uni went out to regional Vic and re and left the state to get jobs. And I thought, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to hang with my mates and, you know, enjoy being around them. And um, so I did that and that was well worth it. Um, and then, yeah, got got back and it was probably 2018. I thought, all right, well, now we're going to start making some moves. So did a few internships at Port Melbourne Football Club, um, did one with the South Metro Junior Footy League, um, did some great work with them, um, growing the social media channels. And that's where, yeah, I learned about this new space, about digital media, because um, my dream had always been, you know, Herald Sun, that kind of stuff. And when I looked more into it, I saw, yeah, the digital space is absolutely where we need to be. Um, and then, yeah, I was lucky enough to get to zero digital media. And um, that's been awesome. Been there for just over 12 months. I started off doing horse racing there. Now doing a bit of bit of everything, but mainly footy. Um, yeah, doing that, and then yeah, launching a podcast uh, this week, probably today. Actually, we'll probably launch that on the Insta channels. Um, and yeah, so it's it's been a long burn for me, but I'm absolutely loving it at the minute, and it's been good fun now. Yeah, I love it. Well, before I continue, what's are we allowed another podcast name yet, or is it uh, is it a secret? No, no, we, we'll we'll divulge it now. You're actually the first ones to know. I've kept it from a lot of mates. Um, it's going to be real talk with Benno. Obviously, yep. I'm Benno, and no one really calls me Jake in my circles. Um, it's just going to be essentially talking to public figures. The first two episodes are actually former Carlton players. I've got Jake Edwards, who's now also on Married at First Sight, and um, Nick Graham, who we've spoken to, and they've been terrific guests. And the Nick Graham, is, if, you're a, if you're a Carlton fan that wondered what happened in the Malthouse era, um, make sure you get a hold of the Nick Graham episode because he tells us a lot about what was going on at the footy club at the time. But it's just going to be getting public figures in. I'm going to introduce everyone or a few people I know that I think you've got good stories to share. And it's just going to be storytelling, really. We're just going to just get into some nooks and crannies of some great people and some great stories because I think that's the way the media is heading now. I think clickbait and all this catch your media stuff is just a bit of rubbish. But I think we can tell good stories from good people and, yeah, hopefully we can get the people a bit more in touch with their heroes. Yeah, mate, mate, we're on the same wavelength. I think, um, I mean, very similar to you, I I did the full-time work thing straight away out of uni, studied law, practiced law, and then saw the world for what it was. It was changing. Mm. You know, Arsenal Fan TV was a big inspiration, yeah. really, for, for the channel here. Um, and I remember thinking, like, I remember being aware that something was happening, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how to get involved. I didn't, like, it's like... Who do I talk to? Which which yeah. university does a course? Where, like, where can I find this information? And yeah, it wasn't until I left the country and and just saw startup culture in Israel and the way the Chinese work. And it wasn't until then I kind of clicked that yeah, you you can just start something from scratch. And it's mm -hmm. it's interesting because you start 
I'm assuming you start doing your writing in your case and the media stuff that you're doing, you do it for passion. Yeah. Um, and then there becomes an understanding that if you work hard consistently for weeks, months, years, decades, it can actually become your career, your yeah. livelihood, um, which is quite crazy. And I'm, I'm, I'm more fascinated with the process and yeah. the journey as opposed to, you know, getting to a point where it's a full-time gig for me. H how are you mentally um, approaching the digital media space for your life? Yeah, so as I spoke before, happiness has just been a big one for me. It's something yeah. that obviously you didn't think about when I was younger. I just thought, yeah, get into work and that's how it'll go and that'll be perfect. And then as uni went on, yeah, I lost the passion of it. And I just thought like, well, I don't want to do this, so I'm not going to. And there's no reason to like, and I thought to myself, if I do this now, by 30, I'll be done with it. And yeah. then what? So yeah, I, I left uni and I went traveling and worked and I worked in all sorts. I was a manager of a cinema and I don't really like movies, did that. I worked in retail. I pretty much did it all just to get by and just, yeah, enjoy hanging out with mates. And then I, my nephew was born in 2015 and that was a life changer. Um, so lucky because he lives with me. So we we spent every day together. So I thought, well, I don't want to stop doing this yet. Like, how good's this? Um, and then, yeah, it was just, as he said, just saying what people were doing. And I, I remember I, with the time I went to uni was probably right when podcasts were starting and a lot of our teachers was just telling us, nah, it's not the space. It's not going to go anywhere. I think it was a bit of dinosaur kind of stuff about it. Like they just yeah. didn't buy into it. So we didn't get, I didn't really get taught about that kind of stuff or all, like all this kind of stuff. And, I think it was a boat I missed out on. I think it's why it took me a bit of time to get into it. But I think COVID's been great for me. Like, obviously, people have had it tough and that, and it's been awful and, like, not going to footy and people have lost jobs. But I've been one of the very lucky ones. Like, I was in a job I hated and I got to leave that, mm. like, voluntarily. But I just got to make the choice to leave. And I first, I took time out just to get away because it was not a healthy environment COVID-wise. And then as I was away, I thought, this is awesome. Like, I'm getting a chance to step away and with the support of my family and friends and do stuff I'm really passionate about and I really care about. And then zero, I got to, I got more work at zero and obviously that developed and it was, it was really lucky for me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was just observing that, as you said, that startup idea, it's not, it's not ludicrous. If you enjoy what you're doing, you can make anything work. Yeah. If you were to put the work in, for sure. Yeah. My challenge with the AFL industry that I've noticed is I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure what it is for for your end, but from my end, there's just no agreeing principle that a YouTube channel is media. Oh, um, hundred percent. You know, it's it's gonna come eventually. I think yeah. it, it has to. But naturally, things in Australia, we're just a conservative culture. New oh, ideas mm -hmm. are originally met with a little bit of pushback. You know, mm -hmm. if it ain't broke, don't fix it, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Um, I I look forward to the time when, you know, such platforms as what you do. There's so many others as well that have come up um, mm -hmm. and these YouTube channels and whatnot. I mean, for me, that that is where media is going. People have a choice on what they want to watch now. Yeah, I think 100%. I think you look at things like, and I fully, as a person in the media, I fully support paywalls to an extent. Yeah. I think you like, you got to make money. That's what it's there for. But- I think little like the amount of things that are cut behind paywalls now, I think, you know, it's a bit ridiculous and I think it makes it hard to intake news and mm. it makes people not want to. And I think as well, like, yeah, you said it's not bro, don't fix. It's kind of the attitude from AFL media. I think you look at little things like getting footy on demand. Like they, if you chuck a game from last night on YouTube, they'll block that. Yeah. But they won't put it up anywhere for you to get it because mm. they've got a deal with KO. But not everyone can pay the 15 bucks for KO. Like the the thirteen year old kid that just wants to watch Adam Sard run off half back, it doesn't have fifteen bucks a month. So where's he going to watch that? Well, he's not unless it pops up on Fox Footy by chance in the next two hours, and he's got someone at home to record it for him. So I think yeah, it's very we we just haven't caught up like, and I think we don't really ever. And even like with us at zero, um, I applied for AFL accreditation and got denied, but then was told I oh, just apply on game day and that'll be fine. I was like, well, I know we're a smaller media outlet, but, you know, we're, we're doing the same work. Mm. But, yeah, so that was a bit frustrating. So, like, I went to the Carlton Essen again last week and I had to apply for that um, individually. And there's just little things like that. Yeah, I think hopefully sooner rather than later, um, people in the industry can click on that this is where it's heading. Yeah. And this is where people want to intake their content. 
Mm-hmm. Like you just look at all you gotta do is look at buying a TV, mm. and it has YouTube on the as a button on the remote. It's because that because people are watching that on their televisions now as TV. Yeah. So, I think yeah, hopefully that hopefully sooner rather than later we can make the move into that space because I think it's clearly it clearly works across the world. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we just haven't caught up to it yet here. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. I could go on for hours, but I do want to. <laughs> I do want to go on back to the baggers. Um, yeah. We're entering a very interesting time. We're in year six of the five year plan. Yeah. Um, at the time of filming this, we've just played our second preseason match against the Saints. We lost last night, but um, some positive signs. I don't want to talk too much about the game last night because this yeah. is all obviously the memory of you as as the Carlton man. But um, where are you? placed mentally with the club at a high level yeah so i'm i'm very i'm very bullish about the blues and i think a lot of my friends would say it's probably one of my faults as i always have been um but i think so i think we've spoken before about the stage of the reboot i think i see it a bit differently than a lot of people i think i, I don't see the start of this build as that weeder in kerno mckay draft i think i like we kind of had to go back to go forwards and I think 2018 is the year I look at that. That was the first year of this list. Mm. Like that was the that was gone. Like we got rid of most of the players that were just kind of in to fill space. And that was the first year we really went, all right, this is our team. Off you go. Um, but yeah, I can understand why a lot of fans would be saying this is year six, because yeah, it, it is technically been a long time in this build. Um, but oh yeah, I'm very I think the list is in great shape. I think the boys are they're looking good, like all the like guys like Paddy Dow are looking good. Lockie O'Brien looked good last night in patches. Um, and obviously we've recruited really well, which I think has been a real big problem for the football club over the past 20 years. Mm. But we've recruited really well. Everyone seems to be doing the right things. And yeah, I don't I, I don't think there's any reason why we won't play finals. But having said that, if we don't, I don't necessarily think it's a failure. I think that gap between 6th to 12th is actually very, very competitive. And I think it's probably the hardest year there's been to make that jump. So if we don't make it, I don't think it's the end of the world, but I can understand why people would say it that way. But I, I think we make it. And um, yeah, I, I was I, like, honestly, having lost so many games for so long, I'm just happy to win games again. Yeah. I know we don't want to be that club, but like, I'm, I don't think I'll ever take for granted winning football games again as a fan. Yeah. Because it's been so long between doing it. I remember 2018 like it was yesterday. I remember oh. going into games saying, "Can we just get a good quarter in? Can we? Can oh. we just get? Can we just not be down by five goals at halftime?" No, it was. It was the weirdest year too because we started. We keep the first five goals of the season. Yeah, <laughs> we 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 we're gonna beat Richmond in that first quarter, and it was just a, it was a weird year. Like I remember, I remember thinking that year, gone are the days of getting pumped. Not gonna happen anymore. And then we like we just got walked around. Like it was really weird how bad we were. Yeah. Like, we just got absolutely walked around by some teams. Like, I remember the, the, the game against Adelaide in the last round was just the biggest joke because we, like, it was just that show of, like, here's a side playing good football and here's a side not. And this is the difference. And they just, oh, yeah. There was, and there were so many games like that at Eddie Had. It was always at Eddie Had. Always. And it would just be silent in the ground. Yeah. Because I think mean, papers didn't know what to do. And, I think I do look at that year now with a bit of like, huh, you know what, it, we got through it and good stuff. But at the time, it was it was hard to go to the football. It, that was an that was an awful time. Yeah, yeah. Well, you really found out who was the who were the real fans as opposed to the plastic fans. And but having said mm-hmm. that, I, I feel like we're very blessed with the fan base that we do have, mm-hmm. where we really are the next sleeping giant. I think Richmond have probably fulfilled that you know that prophecy. Yeah. Um, they finally did it, and now they don't look like losing anytime soon. Mm. Um, I'm just hoping that that is what's coming our way. Like we've gone, we're going to go through quite a bit of failure. We have gone through quite a bit of failure um, over and over and over again. Do you, speaking of that, do you see this group going through the Richmond failure over and over and over again until they just eventually fall over the line and then just can't, you know, can't lose? Or do you think there's going to be a bit of a quantum leap? I'm probably more on the side of quantum leap just because of the list demographic. Yeah. So I mean, you look at the list. I mean, for a long time, we haven't had any players in their prime years. And even mm. guys that have been close to that, like guys like Lockie Plowman, your Mark Banks, like they didn't play a lot of football before getting to the club. Will Setterfield, another one, who they played like six, seven games. So I think it's taken us a bit longer to get like 80, 100 games into these players. And I, yeah, I think the list has come together. I think they've built a list to make a leap. And um, whether that happens or not, it's another question. But... 
I think they've built the list going, well, we're going to try and make... We're, gonna, we're not going to try and eke our way into a, a premiership. We're going to go and win one. Mm. And whether that happens in 2021, 2022, or if it happens in 2024, I don't think they're too like bothered about times. But this list, they've gone, this list will win a premiership. We're building it for that. When it happens is up to them, mm. essentially. But... Yeah, I don't. I don't say it's aching one out just because I think yeah, the list demographic doesn't really fit. Like if you look at like Liam Jones is thirty. If we lost three finals, he's thirty three, mm. and then it's like oh, okay, well, you know them. And then Cripper's twenty nine, and all of a sudden the pressure gets put on. And I'd like to think that they're thinking ahead and thinking, well, how do we prevent that fall off? Because I think Cripper said on the Dylan Friends podcast last week, he said we want to be a sustained threat. We want to be like your Geelongs and your West Coast that are just there and you just expect that. I think for that to happen, the list has to be prepared 10 years in advance. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping that's what they're doing. Yeah. You're confident in this group and, and its makeup? Yeah, I, I don't think there's too many holes in there. Like, I think one tale I've always had, like, you know, everyone kind of has that player they just can't stand. And I don't really have that at our list now mm. for the first time ever. I look at our list and there's not really a player there where I go, I oh, just don't want to see them play. Like, I look at this and go, yeah, it's pretty. Like, there's not really a hole. Like, the ruck is an ideal, like, in terms of just experience. But uh, Pitta has been, looks like he's taken a real step forward in the first two pracky matches. And, the, I mean, if the King gets games, I mean, Jesus Christ, he's exciting. And premiership teams don't generally have a star ruckman, which is mm-hmm. something I've noticed over the last five to ten years. You haven't seen too many sides win a flag with a superstar ruckman. So, I don't think you necessarily need one. You need someone that's going to compete and be viable around the ground, which we have. Our defense looks incredibly strong. Our forward line, if up and running, I'm very confident in. Um, I think with better ball movement, we'll see guys like McGovern and Silvani involved in the game more. Um, and then if Kaz can get up, I mean, I mean, if we're able to win, play finals with him playing half a season or not at all, I mean, imagine what we do when he gets in the side. Like, so yeah, I'm, I'm very bullish about where this list is going. I think, I think it's it's built well, I and mean, there's no real obvious holes in it, which is key. Yeah, yeah, you touched on a point about yeah the, the players that you you can't stand seeing. I, I'm with you there. There've been so many players over the years where we've turned up to a certain game, whatever whatever game it is, and then X player is playing, and you just say to yourself, "We're gonna have to carry this bloke today because he's just not you know up to the standard that we like." You just know you're not yeah. winning a final with X player, Y player, oh. and it's nothing nothing against them personally, but you just kind of knew that you had to carry a few. Yeah, like there was. I, I'm not gonna. I won't name them because I mean I've got utmost respect for anyone that's on the Carlton jumper. Mm. Um, so I'm not gonna name because there was one that's only recently departed that I really just couldn't. I couldn't have, and um, it got to the point where my missus knew. She knew that if this bloke was playing, that <laughs> I was gonna lose my head, and um, and she just like she'd hear me. She just go, "Was it?" I'm like yes. Um, but yeah, as I said, like. It's not. It's not their fault either. Like they're doing their best, and and that, the club was in a situation where we probably had to have a few players on the list like that. And that that's why I'm not going to come out and name them, pot them, because like you know, I mean, they're clearly 20, 30, 40, 50 times better football than I am. Mm. They're playing Carlton, so you know, thank them for their efforts. But you know, happy where the list is at now. Yeah, that's the challenge. I think with um, that, I, you know, yourself, me, anyone who really speaks and, you know, creates content. That's the challenge that I've learned over the journey. I mean, at the start of the channel, I was very just brash, mm. you know, really uh, learnt spots where I, you know, you've got to be, you've got to have that human element to it. I think it comes with maturity. I think it comes with just analyzing what you're doing, trying to get better. Um, but then obviously, you know, growing up, maturing as well. Um, there is that fine line. I mean, it, criticism is fine and it's welcome and it's actually needed because the fans hold the club accountable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there is this notion uh, that, you know, you can cross the line. It's important to always remember that it, like as much as I love Carlton and footy, it's just footy, you know? Yeah. And to be fair, in the context of the world, it's really a tiny sport. Yeah, I think for a long time, I, I was one of those people that kind of let it define me wake. And I probably still am to an extent, like, but working in sports media now, you kind of realize how mundane it really can be. Like you talk to someone and like you talk to a footballer and they like they, they've moved on. And like because they have to. And then I was sitting there, like, and some like I remember I spoke to one player last year from the Bulldogs and they'd just lost a game and he he was pretty like he didn't really it's like as if he didn't care. And obviously he cared, but they'd moved on. Mm. And I noticed him like, oh, if you've moved on, what what's the point in me holding on to this? Like because it, it means less to me, really, than it does you. 
So why do why do I still care? But I think in terms of like player criticism, it's definitely it's it's needed to an extent. But I think I think too often people look to do it. Like I think scapegoats are just massive for footy fans. And I think one that I'll I'll defend to the hill and from Carlton that I I love is Lockie Plowman, and he, he's my favourite player. I think he is unbelievable, and he he cops it left, right, and centre from Carlton fans, especially last year. And I, he's finished top five B and F last two years. He, he really gets beaten. He plays big. He plays small. He kicks the ball within his limits. And I think we've we've got to be careful about that gang up mentality because I mean some people might be able to deal with it. If you're saying you know every fan every, like just you getting hammered week in week out. I think it, it, we don't know the toll it takes. I think we need to be very careful about yeah. scapegoating easy players or potting blokes without knowing what's going on. Yeah. Like people potted Cripper last year, but he had well documented off field issues and his shoulder popped out three times. And it's like, well, you know, if you had that at your job, you'd probably suck at it too. Yeah. So there, like, it's definitely, there is a real space for criticism, but I think we just need to be so much more careful than what we are yeah. about what we're it, saying. I feel like there just needs to be an intellect to it. I mean, mm. one thing I've noticed, obviously, you know, been doing the Blue Abroad thing for a couple of years now. So I, reading through comments, it's been something I've been doing for years and you sort of learn trends and, you know, behaviours. Yeah. And I find that a lot of people, you don't know what's going on in people's lives. Some people are doing it tough. Some people did it extra tough last year with COVID and it's yeah. almost like they're waiting for the footy to start because they're so angry with what's going on in their lives that they're not either addressing or they're not able to to fix or not willing to fix that having that ability to tell someone else what they should be doing is that escapism for them. And it's that, that allows them to feel a bit better about themselves as opposed to looking themselves in a mirror and fixing what they've got to fix up. Um, and that's tough. And that's very tough. And you mentioned Lockie Plowman. He's the case in point. I, I remember I did a, yeah. a review in, I think it was the first year I was, it would have been like the seventh video I did of the reviews. Um, I thought he had a poor game. I thought his body language was poor. I think it was the game Liam Jones got knocked out in 2019. Yeah. And I, there was a piece of footage where he was smiling. And I took that really, like, I didn't like seeing it. I was yeah. just really hurt seeing that. And I lashed out and the second I watched it back, I was like, what are you doing, mate? Like learn, mm. like and I'll never do that again. And literally, this channel changed from that moment. That, yeah, that, you know, I realized what I wanted to do with criticism and not criticism, but just with analyzing the game, how I wanted to yeah. do it, and it, like it wasn't that way, you know. I got my hundred percent for you. If you say something you don't like, say it. That's fine. But one, there's two things to that. One, address it that you don't like it, and like, like you know, it might not be what I think it is, but I th I took it this way, and that way you, you're not. You know, you're not having a go at the play, but you just ignore it. You're just saying that I took it this way, and that's fine because mm. everyone can interpret things how they want. And that way, you're just clearing it up that you're not saying it's fact. It's because your opinion, and that's yep. completely good. And two is knowledge, and I think knowledge is a key one because obviously, I think we're in a fortunate position. We get access to a lot more knowledge than some other people might just because of our jobs. But people like, like I think Mitch McGovern's a case. Like he cops a hammering, and fair enough at times he's been not superb for us, but his role is critical. And I think some people don't always understand that or what he what he's trying to do each game. And it would change week to week and we don't even really know every week. But some people go, he's only had like six touches. He needs to go. And it's like, yeah, but he's had three score involvements. So, you know, all right, six touches isn't enough, but three score involvements is heaps. So, you know, his role, like well, he touches the ball, we score. Okay, so you can't drop him because he is involved in scores. And I think people sometimes just say your simple stat line and, and it's fair enough. It's 100% fair to not look too deep. And if you don't want to, that's fine. But I think that's where I sometimes get my back up a bit. Because I think like, oh, yeah, right. Like, it's easy to pot the bike that's had six touches. Mm. But what about the bike that had 22 and turned it over six, like six or seven times? Yeah. Like, what game would you rather have, really? So I think we get, like, there's just a fine line between, yeah, as you said, but criticizing for the sake of it because you're because you've had a like an average week, which is fair. Like, you want to vent, vent. We absolutely love that. But then venting at someone because they didn't do what you wanted them to do, it's like well, that might not have been their job that week. Yeah, no, fair, fair. I've got two more questions for you. I always ask these two well, from, on most episodes. Um, I want to know, well, I want to know your favourite player outside of Carlton, if you could bring them to the club. We've got an unlimited salary cap this time around, no brown paper bags. Who's coming? Mitch Duncan. Yeah? Yeah, not even blinking. Wow. I, I love him. I think he is... 
If he wasn't at Geelong, he'd be the best player in any team, really. Maybe yeah. other than Geelong and Richmond. Yeah. I, mean, I reckon Richmond would still be their best player. He's unreal. He doesn't turn it over. He kicks goals. He gets so much outside football and just uses it. And that's it's what you need. If you're going to play outside, you've got to use the ball. And he uses it so well. He he can take kick-ins and he can launch attacks from there. He can get forward and kick goals. I. Yeah, I, I was pretty disappointed. He, he, he was a free agent last year, and he signed halfway through the year, and I was gutted. Mm. I was genuinely gutted because I thought that, that's, that's the player we need. And, yeah, I'm, I love him. Absolutely love him. I like that one. No one said that. Uh, it's usually the Bond or Dusty or Fife or Grundy. Yeah. So I like that. I like that from you. Um, final question, and this will go down you know, in the history books. We'll look back on this in a decade. When does this group win the premiership? When do they lift up the cup? Oh, I'll probably say 2023 is okay. probably the year. If you look at the demographic of the list, that gets Cripper to 28, I think. It gets Walshy to 23. And I think that's the key. Them two, they're the bookends, really. Like, you got, like Walsh and Cripper will probably only play eight years together. And then Walsh, will, like Walsh might not even be his prime by the time Cripper leaves. Um, so I think get... Well, it's close to his prime, Cripper just at the end of it. Uh, I think that's our sweet spot. So I think everything in between will be coming together. Hopefully we recruit again this year, which I think the club has said they're going to do. Um, who exactly the targets are, I'm not quite sure at this point. But recruit again, it's top up. Charlie gets fit. And I think, there's, yeah, 2023 probably looks as the, the big, the boom year for me. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I, it's, I think it's the most common answer so far. It's uh, there's plenty of time. I think exactly what you said as well. There's the bookends. There's the the Walsh and the Crips. Um, and uh, if we can recruit well again, do you think we? Yeah, do you, do you have anyone on your on your mind at the moment for recruiting for the end of twenty one? It's hard because there's quite a few free agents, but I think we're going to see a lot of people re-sign because I don't think the money's going to be on offer as it has been in the past. I think we've seen Gorn re-sign yesterday and Rory Laird today. Mm. Um, Because I don't think clubs are going to offer the money that they have in the past for free agents. I just think with this shortened salary cap, uh, clubs are going to try and keep the players they have. And obviously, that's a big job for us this year with Cripper and Harry coming out of contract, among plenty others. So I don't think we're going to go and get the big $900,000 player again. But I think, I don't know an exact player, but I think if we can get a key defender... um, Although I'm I'm a big fan of Luke Parks, who we got in the draft. He looks like he's a great intercept marker. And then obviously we've got Marky there as well if he gets fit. But we can get another K defender in just as cover. And obviously someone that can just blossom behind Liam Jones because he's 30 already. Um, and then another out, another A grade me. I think Zach Merritt's obviously the one that's been spoken about a lot. I think he'd put, like he'd be a big player on our side. And I think a lot of people might not recognize the work he does because he's in a pretty average side because Essendon suck. Yeah, um, but yeah, we love it. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> but um, I think his, his foot skills would be... I think mean, we saw last night how critical it would be going forward, especially when the forward line broke down. Um, if we can get Zach Merritt in, I think... And I think we can. I think, we, you know, this is not going anywhere anytime soon. We're clearly going to play finals, and he hasn't won one yet. So it's a pretty easy sell for mine. And if we can bring him in the door, I think it opens up our midfield terrifically. And all of a sudden, it, it's a deep midfield. And I think we've had one of those... Probably ever, really. So I think, yeah, for that merit, if we had to pick one, but if we can just get a key defender and an, ins- and an outside mid, I think that's pretty much all we're really lacking at this stage. Love it. Love it. Well, mate, it's uh, been the quickest 38 minutes, whatever it's been, I've, yeah. I can remember. It just flies by once you, inst- once you start going, it just flies oh, by. Mate, could go forever. Yeah, but uh, really appreciate your time. Um, appreciate your work. Um, for those of you, for those in the audience who haven't seen your work, where can we find you? You see, you can go to Zero Digital Media, or the easy way is on Facebook and Twitter, Zero Hanger. Um, and then you can also follow me on Twitter. Um, and then there's the podcast, which will be on Instagram today. Yep. Um, Real Talk with Benno. Um, as I said, two very good episodes with two great Carlton people, uh, Jake Edwards and Nick Graham. And some very good insights into what the football club was like in probably a darker time. So make sure you get onto those. They'll be out in the next week or two. But yeah, Zero Hanger is probably the place to get most of my news. Perfect. Well, I'm going to put them in the description below, some links in there as well. I'll get that podcast link from you as well and yeah. and uh, chuck them down there. And uh, mate, uh, looking forward to 2021 and uh, looking forward to seeing you over the next few years and uh, having a chat once we've got that flag.
Yeah, mate. Looking forward to it. I can't. We'll, we'll bump into each other on Ligon Street. I'm sure. Once the no doubt, ends. no doubt, mate. Go the baggers, hey. Up the blues. <laughs>